Hi everyone, welcome to our first video lecture for Unit 1. Uh, throughout the semester we will be doing a variety of video lectures. Some of them will be shorter, some will be longer, but it really depends on how much material we have to get over and how in-depth we need to go. So, for example, this first lecture is going to be relatively short. I'm going to kind of go through the material material relatively quickly and that's just because the material that is covered in this first chapter is pretty basic um, but there could be other chapters where I really have to get into it a lot more the way that I tend to set my lectures up is I will go over the concepts in the reading but a lot of times I will add additional material into it uh, this will allow us to get a little bit more in depth and of course the book can't always cover everything that I want you to know. So these lectures will help supplement them, the material that you read. So it's very important each week that you do watch all of the video lectures in full. A lot of times too, depending on the material, I will actually be showing examples and be doing things on the screen that I would be doing if we were in a classroom in person and using a board. So. Each one will be a little bit different for the most part. Like I said, this one will be pretty quick and relatively straightforward. So this particular unit unit talks about um, the science of psychology. And I first wanted to start by saying that even though this is a research methods course in our book specifically is research methods in psychology, I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that the concepts that we're talking about in this course can be applied to many other fields. So for example, I know that there are a lot of students in this course that are actually health science students and they're not psychology majors per se. So those students, I want to make sure you understand that even though a lot of what we talk about, about might specifically refer to psychology or use psychology as an example, you can apply this to your own field. And as we do our research projects this semester, you'll see how to take the information that we are talking about and apply it to your area of interest. I tend to use a lot of examples in psychology because of the fact that I have a background in psychology. So particularly my field is in psychology and because it's in sports psychology, I'll actually tend to use a lot of sports psychology examples just because that's what I'm most familiar with. But I really hope that I can help you figure out how to apply this to your own fields because these, um, these concepts, these methods, these types of research, everything can be used for any of the social sciences. So to start off, we're actually going to do a brief um, overview of psychology. Again, this is a little refresher of what is psychology. And psychology stems from the two words psyche and ology. So psyche is a Greek word meaning soul. And this comes from back uh, when psychology had a lot to do with how the mind and the soul were connected. And this was before psychology was even a true word. It, this was a time when people were examining the mind, but it wasn't done in a scientific manner per se. It actually fell underneath the field of philosophy. And the reason for that is because a lot of people spent time theorizing about the mind and how the mind worked and how it was connected to the soul and the world around us, but there wasn't any true science behind it at the time. Eventually, especially in the 1800s, we had um, someone named Wilhelm Wundt, is how you say it, a German scientist. He came along and he was actually the first psychologist, the first one to be called a psychologist, because he started to examine the mind in a way that resembled true science. So ology is a root meaning, meaning the scientific study of. So if you put psychology together, you get the scientific study of the mind and behavior. And the reason that the mind and behavior is combined is because when we talk about the mind, it is very hard to directly observe it. And throughout this class, we're going to talk about the importance of observation. So the way that psychologists began to view how to get around the problem of the fact that we cannot actually view what's going on in the mind is we can observe the behavior that results from our mind. So 
how do, how do emotions influence our behavior? How do our thoughts influence behavior? How do our perceptions influence behavior? And there are areas of psychology that's fo focused specifically on the mind and other areas that's focused um, focus specifically on behavior. But for the most part, the broad definition of psychology talks about the combination of mind and behavior together. So like I said, we'll, you'll be hearing the word observe quite a bit throughout this course because, because observation really is one of the key um, components of research. So this chapter talked off, started by talking about different methods of research or I'm sorry, different methods of knowing. And there were five specific methods that they mentioned. Intuition, authority, rationalism, empir empiricism, and the scientific method. So we'll start off by talking about intuition. And intuition essentially is the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. And what that means is we are using our instincts and our emotion to know something. Um, oftentimes intuition is referred to trusting your gut. And the reason for that is because people often associate intuition with an actual physical feeling or um, a state. So when someone is using their intuition to know something, they just they just know it. It's It comes to them naturally. There is very little conscious thought or reason or logic that has to come along with it. Essentially, it just is when someone feels like at that moment they understand it, regardless of whether or not they have any history, you know, researching it or any history or experience with it specifically. Um, intuition is very strongly connected with emotion and it actually has been shown that um, intuition is connected to things like genetics and heredity and your biological makeup. And because of that, one of the weaknesses with intuition is that it can often be wrong because it's not based on any logic or scientific evidence. Uh, there actually has been studies out there that show that intuition is influenced by a variety of different things. It can be influenced the t by the time of day it can be influenced on your sleep patterns. Are you tired or are you awake? Um, it can be influenced by your hunger level. It can be influenced by how you were, um, the environment that you grew up in. So for example, if you grew up around people who were um, not risk takers and you weren't taught specifically to take risks, your intuition could be extremely conservative where you might not really, um, you might not go for things that someone who is a risk taker is. And it's just because of the fact that your history made it so that way, when you feel like you know something, it's based on these past experiences. But like I said, because it's not based on true logic and there's no scientific evidence backing up this, this, thing that you know without actually knowing it, um, it can often be wrong. However, on the flip side, that doesn't mean that intuition shouldn't be in trusted. Because it is based off of our instincts, it actually, they believe lies in our, um, our original, you know, instincts back from our early evolution of fight or flight, our need for shelter and hunger, because it's based on these instincts, often de decisions that are based on intuition may be superior than those based on logic. And they find that when someone makes a decision based on intuition, they actually tend to stick to that decision stronger and are more motivated, depending on what the decision is, to, um, if it's a decision to do something, someone could be more motivated if the decision is based on this intuition and this feeling of emotion than if it's based on logic or reason or someone telling you you should do something because it's right. So intuition is a very interesting subject in the field of knowing things. Um, but we're just gonna, like I said, uh, just gloss over this as a very basic level for now. Moving on, the next one is authority. And what authority is, is 
It is accepting an idea because an authority figure tells you to. So examples of this would be a parent telling you to do something, a teacher telling you to do something, government telling you to do something. Um, social media influences are huge right now. People on social media telling you to do things. Uh, and the problem with this, quite obviously, is that when we are learning things and listening to an authority figure, one of the weaknesses is that following an individual blindly just because they are this figure of authority, depending, regardless of how you look up to them, um, it can lead to consequences. So I really like the image that's on the right hand side of the slide here because it shows essentially an authority figure walking this group of people following them just right off a cliff. So if you are following someone without really understanding why you're following them and you're just doing it because they have this authority, you may make the wrong decisions or just the decisions that aren't the best for you. In addition, the person giving you the information could be wrong. So for example, if you're looking at me, a professor, and essentially I'm an authority figure to my students, I could be telling you things that are completely incorrect. You hope that I'm not, but the, the truth out there is that I could be. And we see that a lot of times with um, a variety of authority figures don't really have their facts straight before they say things. Um, they also might have their own motives. And so depending on why they're telling you something, that can be a weakness for you. The strength with it is that it's a very quick process and it maximizes the amount of information you can learn. So for example, think of a child going through school. As they're learning things, they are believing and accepting the ideas that they're being told from teachers because of the fact that their teachers are their superiors. Now, again, the hope is that what they're being taught is actually true, but because they're not questioning what's going on and they're just accepting this knowledge, they're able to take in a lot of things um, very, very quickly. In the same way that a child trusts a parent and a parent is teaching a child as they grow up a variety of different things about the world. I mean, thousands and thousands of things as a child is growing up, a parent um, is the reason that they learn these things. So. A child, because of the parental bond that they have, will trust them and therefore and accept an idea because this person has the superior authority over them and they're able to learn a, a vast amount of information. If we did not just trust someone and accept what they were saying and always questioned it and had to research it, it would take an extreme amount of time to learn every, anything in a way to allow us to truly believe that it is true. Going on from there, the next one is rationalism. And this essentially is using logic and reasoning to acquire new knowledge. So a little bit different than intuition um, because of the fact that it now contains logic and reasoning. So the way that this works is it uses something called a premise in logic to arrive at a sound conclusion. It is not based on experience whatsoever. It is purely based on logic. And the best way that I can illustrate it is using the example of the cartoon next door, it, or on the side over there, is that um, this little penguin is saying penguins are black and white, and some old TV shows are black and white, and therefore some penguins are old TV shows. So here you're taking the premise of penguins are black and white, and a second premise, that old TV shows are black and white and making a connection and using logic to arrive at the conclusion that penguins are old TV shows. So you see how you connect the dots there. Now, the problem with this is that specific example it does not arrive at a sound conclusion. We know that penguins are not old TV shows. In a most instances, the logic will um, ends up being correct because our premise is correct. But the weakness is that the premise, if the premise is wrong, then the, or there is an error in the logic, then the conclusion will be wrong. Um, because it's not based on experience. So, for example, if you had never been seen or had never seen a penguin, and you had seen old TV shows, and you knew the old TV shows are black and white, but you had never seen a penguin, and someone just told you that penguins are black and white. You're not basing your knowledge on the experience of seeing a penguin. You're basing it on the logic of connecting the colors black and white to um, two different objects, the TV shows and 
penguins. There, there wasn't necessarily any strengths that your book pointed to in here. And I can't think of anything other than the fact that this is something we do every day. Um, as we learn things, we create a variety of different concepts in our mind, and it's our job to connect the concepts. Now, what rationalism doesn't point out is that we do experience things. No one has no experiences. So because we have experiences, even if we make connections that are necessarily wrong, the hope and the most common thing that occurs is um, even if they were wrong to begin with, we sort it out and do learn that they were incorrect and correct this logic so that way the conclusion is a true one. From there, empiricism, I have the hardest time saying this word, which means acquiring knowledge through observation and experience. So where rationalism did not use experience, empiricism does use experience. And specifically what it's talking about is that there's this belief that in individuals do not have this inherent knowledge that everything we learn in the world is based on the experiences we have. Um, for example, learning to walk, a true, someone who truly believes in empiricism would believe that we learn how to walk based on experience by exploring that we can't be told how to walk, especially thinking on a child. A child doesn't understand language as well necessarily when during the um, during the time of life when we are learning to walk. So it's based on how we explore the world around us. And over time, the experience leads to us walking. So it's the experience piece and the observation piece that makes it empiricism its own realm. A weakness with this is if someone was to have limited experiences, then that means they would have limited knowledge. Imagine someone who is shut up in a room, a single room their entire life, their knowledge would be extremely limited because of the fact that they have not experienced anything. Similarly, um, or I would say on the opposite end of the, the spectrum there, our perception is very easily influenced by experience. And what that means is that we may perceive something in one way based on one experience, and then we could have a whole new experience and our perception about that thing could completely change in an instant. So it's so easily influenced that it's hard to stay steady. So it's easy to have our judgment clouded, um, especially when we're talking about knowing something where we may think we may know something in one way, we could change our mind and say we know it in another way. And there's a lot of changing back and forth. Um, however, on the opposite end, the strength with this is that empiricism is actually the heart of the scientific method and therefore the heart of science. It's this idea that as we go through life, we have all of these experiences and these experiences lead to us wanting to explore more and question the world around us. And if it wasn't for these experiences and these observations um, that we gained we would not be able or we would never have explored and discovered what we know today. With that being said, it leads me to the final one, which is the scientific method. And the scientific method sh should be relatively familiar to most of you. It's something that's talked about um, all the way back in middle school, sometimes elementary school, but it probably has followed most of you throughout your um, academic career. And it's this systematic collection and evaluation of evidence to test ideas and answer questions. So with the scientific method, the way that it works is it starts with this question up here. And then this is a um, visual visualization of how the scientific method works, where we go down the row and we follow these steps until we get to a specific result. So the first four methods that we talked about of knowing, the intuition, authority, rationalism, and empiricism, are used to generate ideas and questions, but it's the scientific method that is actually the next step to this. A weakness with the scientific method is that there's not always enough time and resources. So going back to the example um, or the type of knowing authority, how I was saying we, with authority, we just accept things based on the fact that a superior is telling us. 
the reason why that works so well is because we don't have time in a lot of times we don't have the resources to stop and question and do all of these steps in order to figure out what the truth is. Um, another weakness is that empiricism or the scientific method cannot answer all questions. It can only answer empirical questions. And we're going to talk a little bit later about what that means. The third weakness is that it doesn't always lead to the correct answer. So essentially what happens is we could go through all of these steps and we could come to a conclusion and the result might not be the true conclusion. As much as it might seem correct, we may find out down the road that it actually is not. A strength with this, though, is that it can provide, provide sound evidence to support facts. This is what science is based on, are these steps. So because we go through these carefully planned, systematic steps, we are able to say with a certain level of certainty that something is true. Um, I'm really sorry, my cat, some of you guys might have just heard my cat crying in the background. Um, okay, so moving on. The next piece of this talks about understanding science and what that means. And the book points out that we have three fundamental features of science. We have systematic empiricism, empirical questions, and creating public knowledge. And these, these are the features that make up science. Starting with systematic empiricism, basically what this is is that learning is based on a planned systematic observation. It's not just seeing. When we are being systematic about it, we are approaching something with a plan in place. We are saying these are the steps that we're going to take in order to make a specific observation. It's not just walking around in the world and seeing things around us. Observation specifically has a purpose. We are looking for something. We are trying to answer a question. We are trying to gather data for a specific reason. The third thing, empirical questions, um, are questions about the way the world actually is. And what this means are there are questions that can be measured scientifically. So questions like um, the ratio of males to females at the college. We can actually measure and count the number of males and females and come up with a ratio. We can look at the average amount of um, sugar, or I'm not, let's not say sugar, the average amount of soda consumed by a, an American family. And even though you can't measure it with every single family, you can collect enough data from enough different families around the United States on their soda consumption and come up with this average number. Um, so when you're talking about empirical questions, you want to ask yourself, can I measure this? And if you cannot measure it, then it becomes a non-empirical question. And those are questions that have what we call subjective answers or opinion-based answers. Some examples would be, who is the smartest in class? Well, even in this specific question, you can look at test scores, but the true piece of this is how do you define smart? There's a lot of different types of intelligence. So you have to be careful with a question like that to make sure that you are being specific about what you are asking. If you're saying, who is the smartest in class based on test scores, then yes, this question will become an empirical question. But if you ask a broad question like smart, who is the smartest in class, that could be very subjective. You could have one person in class say, oh, it's, it's John. And you could have another person in class say, oh, it's Sarah. Um, so it depends on what is being asked and how it's being asked. A question like, what is the best flavor of ice cream? Well, you can... If you ask a broad question like that, it's an opinion based. Um, if you were to say, what is the most common favorite flavor, flavor of ice cream, then that can turn into an empirical question because you can actually start to count people's uh, favorite flavors and come up with an average based on counting. But if you just ask the general question of what is the best flavor, well, it's subjective, it's an opinion. Another thing, more non-empirical questions are questions that have to do with values. And a question like that might be like, what makes a person good or bad? Well, this is a really hard question to answer. And even though we have some general ideas about what is good or bad in a person, one person may say, 
you know, cheating on a test makes them a bad person. But someone else could look at that and say, well, there's way worse things that they could actually do than cheat on a test. So I don't think that makes them a bad person. But because it's talking about a value, which is a very, very complex um, topic, it's hard to make that an empirical question. I want you to remember that, again, wording and how the questions are asked and the purpose of the questions and how specific the questions are, that also plays a part on whether or not it is a non-empirical question, an empirical question, because you can have non-empirical questions be worded in a way to make them empirical. The next thing is that um, the idea that science creates public knowledge is a piece of a, or a fundamental feature of it. And what that means is that science is a social process. Even though often, oftentimes scientists are thought of as these secluded people in labs, um, not really socializing with the world, and it's actually an extremely social process. That means that there are many studies that are being conducted by a lot of different researchers around the world about the exact same thing. You could have a hundred studies examining the exact same question. And the fact that you have all these people conducting different studies is what makes it social. And the reason that this is so important in terms of a feature of science is that if we didn't have all these people or the social process within it, then it would be extremely one-sided. Um, what ends up happening is when people do research, it becomes, it turns into publication generally. And that not only spreads the information that they find and share the conclusions that they reached, but it also allows other people to examine it and look for correction. Um, we'll talk later on in the semester about what happens with these publications, but the basic concept is that People look at it and they look at their methods and how they did their research and they determine whether or not there were any flaws in the study. And this will allow people to say, well, if you did it this way or change this and did this differently, um, or maybe this caused a problem, then we can conduct the study again and um, see if the results are different to try to get the most valid and the most 100% correct answer that we can come to. The important thing about science is that there never is a point in time where something is 100% correct. There is always some even minuscule error of doubt, but this social process helps to make maintain that the knowledge that's out there is as true as it possibly can be. And things will continue to evolve over time. If you've taken any courses, or, and gen psychology is coming to my mind here, um, you can see the evolution of what we thought, uh, what, what, what we once believed was true and how that no longer is the case and how theory has completely changed. An example would be how at one point in time, people thought the world was flat. And then over time, we determined that it actually is round. So that has to do with the social process that occurs in science. The next thing it, that it, we discussed is um, science versus pseudoscience. And your book just wants to go over this because it's extremely important to understand what pseudoscience is so you can look out for it. When you're doing research and when we're working on all of our projects, you're gonna be doing article critiques this semester. So understanding what pseudoscience is, is important to make sure that you are looking at fact and not fiction. And so pseudoscience is when an activity or beliefs are claimed to be scientific by their proponents, but they're actually not. And it's extremely common because what happens is it, it appears to be correct and true at first glance, but when you start to examine it, it really is false. So in order for something to be considered pseudoscience, it must meet two requirements. It must first claim or imply that it is in fact scientific, that some sort of scientific procedure came across, but then it also must lack one or more of the three features of science that we discussed earlier. It must have either no relevant observation or if there is observation that goes against the results, they tend to ignore it. 
Um, your book talks about studies where people make claims and there was research done, but the research showed that the claim was untrue and yet the scientists still continue to claim that it's true. Um, another would be that there's no publication. And the reason that pseudoscience often, often has no publication is because if there's no publication, then there's no ability for it to be evaluated or corrected. People um, who are promoting pseudoscience topics don't want anyone to look at it and say, you know, this isn't true. And then the last piece is that it has to address a non-empirical question. And remember, a non-empirical question are questions that are opinion-based, essentially. They're subjective. So in order for something to be a scientific question, it must be what's called falsifiable. And what falsifiable means is that, um, oops, is that it can be proven incorrect, where a question that is non-empirical, because it's opinion, there really is no right or wrong answer. In order for it to be an empirical question, it must be falsifiable, and it must have the ability to be proved incorrect, just as it has the ability to be proved correct. So we're almost done here. Um, some of the goals of science, it, it, your book talks about a broad goal, the fact that we can and should know more about our world. It's something that we as humans often strive to do. It's just in our nature to explore what's around us. And so science helps achieve that. It also talks about three major goals. And the first one being that science is used to describe things. We It's used to provide detail, to provide um, insight into something. It's also used to predict things. And again, prediction is um, any time that we are making a guess on something and saying this is going to happen because of this, um, X will predict Y. And then the last one is to explain things. We want to specifically use science to look at causes of things, cause and effect. Why does something happen? Your book also gives a very um, general definition of or comparison from basic research to applied research. And basic research is research that just is meant to provide more detailed understanding of something. It's not used to address a specific problem where applied research addresses a specific problem in the world. So an example of applied research would be cancer research. It's very much used to address the problem of cancer. Finding a cure for cancer is the main goal of um, the applied research in cancer research, where basic research might be um, just studying cells in the body no specific reason for it. We're just looking at it, trying to, to get more detail about it, trying to get more understanding about it. That would be basic research. Now, the thing about these two is that they are very heavily interconnected. Basic research very much can turn into applied research. So basic research studying cells in the body could then lead to applied research of answering the question and examining the question of um, how to cure cancer in the same way that applied research could then lead scientists to look at other topics that will first start, start out as basic research. So it's kind of like this circular back and forth interrelated connection that these two different types of research have. Um, depending on your research in interest this semester, when we're doing your research project, you'll have to determine whether or not you would be doing basic research or applied research, depending on what your research question is. Um, the book goes on to talk about science and common sense and why we can't rely on it. It gives two specific reasons for it. The first one is something called heuristics. And essentially what this is, is mental shortcuts that we create. And the reason we create it is because we can't know everything at all points in time. And we simply do not have the time or capacity to um, do everything in our heads. If you think about counting people and, you know, if we're looking at a sample size of 100,000 people, there's no way we could put that all together in our heads to figure it out. So heuristics are when we essentially make connections and make these mental shortcuts in order to make assumptions in um, about certain things 
because we just don't have the time to, to do it all in our minds. The problem with this is that heuristics aren't always accurate, as I'm sure you can guess. What we might think is fact is actually just a belief that we have. Um, the next is confirmation bias, which often develops from heuristics, but more so develops from just our general beliefs. And what confirmation bias is, is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. So imagine you believe something and you come across new evidence, you will try to manipulate that in your head without you intentionally even knowing it, but you'll manipulate it in a way so that way it confirms your already existing belief. And what that feels like, and what we often refer to that as, is common sense. So I'm gonna give you an example um, of buying a new car. So some of you may have experienced before, say you get a car and while you were in the dealership, you have the um, you have the sales associate talking about how great your car brand is, and you know if you decide to buy that car, you want to believe them that this brand is great. It's the best. That's why you're making the purchase, and that's why you're putting your money in this product. Okay, so now you have a belief that this car brand is great. Now, when you go out into the world, you might start to notice more and more of the same car that you bought, where before you probably didn't even realize how many were on the road. And as you start to, to notice how many there actually are, because you already have this belief going into it that this car brand is great, what you'll, actually, you'll tend to do is tell yourself that the reason you're seeing so many on the road is because they're great. And it just confirms this original belief that you had. Everyone wants to own this car just like you did, so that's why there's so many on the road. There's actually other mental reasons why you begin to notice um, something like that. And it's not, it doesn't always have to do with the fact that something is great, but your mind uh, tends to be drawn to things that it is associated with. So this is especially true when we ex want something to be true. Confirmation bias is very strong. We don't know it's happening, but we tend to confuse it with common sense. So going back to the car example, if we want to believe something is so great, it just feels like common sense to say, well, of course it is. I bought it and all these other people bought it. It's common sense. It's common knowledge that this is great. However, I'm sure you can guess that does not make it science. Your book also talks about these two concepts of skepticism and uncertainty. And essentially what skepticism is, is when we pause to consider alternatives, we try to look for alternative evidence. When someone says something, we don't necessarily believe it at its um, face value. We want more evidence to make, make our decision on it. And this comes from the fact that even scientists are susceptible to incorrect beliefs. So skepticism to a certain degree is a very good practice. You should question the, the um, knowledge that you learn and what you hear and what you see. Just because of the fact that, like I said, even when we perform the scientific method, it doesn't always turn out to be the correct answer. At the same time, the scientific world also has promoted this tolerance for uncertainty. And it comes from the fact that there are so many things that we don't know, and often we don't have enough evidence to evaluate it truly, that we can't just mistrust everything. So in that sense, we need to have a certain level of tolerance for this uncertainty in order to just live our lives. If we didn't trust anything, then it would be very difficult to have um, high quality lives and move forward. But the good thing about this tolerance for uncertainty is because we know in our understanding of the fact that we might believe something even if it might not be true, it leads to this idea of more scientific inquiry. If we feel uncertain about something, it will lead us to question it and therefore conduct research and hopefully find the right answer. So the last part that we're going to talk about is who conducts research. And your book really goes on to talk about psychology specifically. So I wanted to give you a broader um, idea of this and kind of simplify it. So generally, someone who conducts research is someone with a PhD or some other sort of doctorate, uh, someone with a medical degree, there are PsyDs, there are EDDs. So anyone with the, a, a type of doctor degree generally is the level in which you're actually a researcher. 
Um, it co covers an extremely wide variety of fields in psychology, which is why, I, which includes psychology, but I didn't want to focus specifically on psychology alone. It could be any of the health science and medical fields, other sciences, bio, chem, um, nuclear physics, really any of the sciences. And people who conduct research, research can be part of colleges and universities. Uh, you might find that as you move on, if you're going to a higher level of degree, you might hear some colleges and universities referred to as R1, R2, R3, in the same way that an athletic school is referred to as a D1, D2, and D3. And what that means is an R1 is a research one where research is extremely important at the school. So a school like Harvard is an R1 because research is very important. And that means that the professors there are not only required to teach, but also conduct research. And um, they're expected to conduct research in a manner where they have extraordinary findings. So that doesn't mean that all researchers work in an R1. There are varying degrees in um, the amount of research a professor has to do, but usually most of our research comes out of a college or a university. However, there are also a lot of government agencies that conduct research as well as corporations. And there are some people who have achieved these higher levels of um, degrees who just do free, freelance research. It's a little bit harder because the funding isn't there, but people still conduct research on their own. Either way, regardless of the field, regardless of the type of degree, regardless of where they're coming from, they're people who are working towards providing answers to questions that are empirically supported. Their goal is to provide knowledge. So um, I think that's where we're going to end it for today. This went a little bit longer than I wanted to, but that's okay. So if you have any questions about this, please feel free to let me know. Um, otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture.